Today's video is going to be the third in a three-part series on the cooling and the properties of cooling the Mitsubishi P73 diodes. These are examples of the aluminum gallium arsenide diodes that frequently are being used for projectors and for laser pointers to produce red light. The problem is there is a very big gap between the red light that they produce and the next uh, powerful source of laser light, which is the green 532 DPSS lasers. And so uh, after having done a little bit of research and finding that cooling these diodes has a pretty profound effect on their color, I decided to begin a series of cooling experiments to see how cold we could get them and how orange uh, we could shift them. And so several months ago I did an experiment where I lowered the temperature of a uh, single diode to about minus 25 degrees centigrade and brought the wavelength down about 10 nanometers bluer than the typical 638 nanometers, which is a deep red. Uh, following on that, uh, a couple of months later, I went ahead and did a more sophisticated cooling apparatus where I actually used thicker layers of insulation, uh, dry ice as the cryogen, and placed a, uh, again, a P73 diode in this front chamber that um, projected its beam out through this heated window to a power meter as well as a handheld visible uh, monochromator that allowed me to estimate what the wavelength shift was. And I was able to bring the, the uh, wavelength down about another five or six nanometers beyond what I could with the TEC. I then decided to proceed a little bit further and try liquid nitrogen in this container and I was able to bring the temperature down to about 130 below zero, 140 below zero and then I began to get some pretty serious frost problems on this heated window and decided that if I was going to continue with this I needed to build a more uh, sophisticated apparatus for isolating the diode from uh, the room temperature and therefore the room humidity from the window. So what I did over the last few weeks is I put together a more sophisticated housing for this diode and decided that if I was going to take advantage of the color shift, it would be best to drive the diodes as uh, not hard as possible, drive them at low currents and thereby uh, avoid the tendency of these diodes to redshift with current, uh, as well as use the uh, temperature advantage to bring them to the blue. And so. I placed a uh, dual uh, diode arrangement in this uh, module and then the room temperature optics on top here allow these two dual outputs to be combined into a single output to produce more power. Nevertheless, each diode is not run very hard. The problem with these very low temperatures down at liquid nitrogen temperatures is a lot of these other optics shift so much in terms of their focal length as well as obviously the shift that comes with the wavelength that it wouldn't be practical to isolate this from uh, adjustments uh, by my hands as time goes on as the diodes cool. So the diodes are actually resting inside of this vacuum flask in a vertical direction. And at the end of the video, I'll link to a couple of still images that I have of some of the components that make up the internals here. The problem that you have is that even though the doer maintains a very good thermal barrier to the outside, and the liquid nitrogen sits in it very happily. The diodes have to be in some sort of an arrangement that maintains very uh, strict uh, interaction or a very strict relationship between the room temperature optics and the cryogenic optics, but at the same time maintains strict isolation thermally. And that's very hard to do, and that's why there's a fairly sophisticated setup inside of there that the images will show later. In any case, this is a setup for the test today, and we're going to be running this down to liquid nitrogen temperatures. And so to demonstrate what happens, I have the output of the two diodes. Rather than fold it as they will be in the final setup, I've taken these two optics off and put them on the side to allow the two beams to come out of the end of the apparatus. One beam strikes a right angle mirror that sends it down to the head of the Ophir power meter. The other beam continues on through an anti-reflection coated um, window that sends about a quarter of a percent back through a small lens that further diffuses it, then allows it to strike the cosine filter of a fiber spectrograph. The fiber then sends the, um, the very reduced amount of power from the laser beam uh, through the spectrograph. The spectrograph then sends the uh, data to the computer and it will be displayed on the screen 
uh, during the, during the uh, test. The rest of the beam that passes beyond that window will pass across the room over to a screen where it impinges and shows us just visually what the color looks like as the uh, diodes are cooled. Now what I'd like to do is uh, just describe what you're going to be watching as this diode cooling process occurs. It's similar to the other uh, videos, but if you haven't seen them before, I'll just review them quickly here. I have the diodes powered by a uh, FlexMod P3 uh, laser driver, which in turn is powered by just a generic uh, Meanwell power supply at about 6 volts. The driver is then modulated by an input voltage from this power supply such that if I were to drive this all the way up to 5 volts, I would produce a total of 3 amps coming out of this driver. And we're not going to do that today. We're going to run these things relatively low power. Finally, up here are the monitors. This is the head of the uh, power meter showing the milliwatts that are impinging on uh, the head from the one diode that's uh, reflected down to it. Over here is the thermistor that is mounted between the two diodes within the housing that actually mounts the diodes onto the cold plate within the um, Dewar flask. It's pretty neutrally uh, positioned between do both diodes and farther away from the cryogens than the diodes themselves, so odds are it's a pretty good representation of the temperature at the flange of the diode. And then finally, up here, I have the uh, spectrograph output that is being sent through LabVIEW as a um, data um, processing software package. And by just clicking the mouse, I can move the uh, cursor just to show us a reading of what the wavelength is at the peak where it's operating right now. At 32 degrees centigrade, we're running at about uh, 638 nanometers, visibly quite red. So, what I'm ready to do now is I'm going to go ahead and do the cooling operation. And so, I'm going to be pouring in liquid nitrogen here. It runs into the Dewar flask, fills the lower part of the Dewar, and I'm going to do this slowly because there is no electronic control over the temperature, so you're going to have to be watching the temperature meter at the same time that you're watching what happens to the power output and what happens to the peak of the wavelength on the um, spectrograph. So I'm going to go over here to the liquid nitrogen, and I'm going to get my very fancy liquid nitrogen container. And we're going to pour some of the liquid nitrogen into the container from this cup. I may do this several times during the test. Physics is neat, isn't it? So here we go. The temperature is at 32.6 degrees. And I'm going to pour a little bit of this in here. Not much. Now it'll take a while because the apparatus that holds the diodes in the chamber actually isolates the metal structure from the glass by uh, good seven or eight millimeters. So the vapor is probably all that's really contacting the metal at this point. But I want to do this again, like I said, fairly slowly. So I may uh, be pouring this in in small increments. You'll sometimes notice a little frost developing on this tube as I do this. Already the temperature is beginning to decline slowly. Some of this could simply be because the um, vapor is moving around within the chamber. Alright, now I'm going to add a little bit more. 
Now, one of the things that you'll find interesting is I've got the window heat uh, on at about uh, oh, five or six watts, and it's running at about 41.4 degrees. Uh, what I found sometimes uh, during some of the testing of the chamber is that the simple boiling vapor that comes out of the inside of the chamber as it passes the window at the top uh, will actually cool off the window uh, just because of the flow of very, very cold nitrogen vapor. That's one of the reasons not to pour this too fast because the vapor that is created as you're beginning to cool the parts produces a lot of volume and you're pushing a lot of gas up and you don't want to push the, uh, the gas up to the point where you get vigorous boiling and the, and the uh, liquid nitrogen is actually spraying around the inside. I'm not sure if that would damage anything, but it's probably going to produce some pretty unpredictable temperatures. Okay, the temperature is beginning to go down a little bit. And just of note, you might see that the temperature of the, the power output right is now 256 milliwatts at about 27.7 degrees centigrade. Now this is pretty much the starting point. We've cooled it slightly, but if you look at the um, image on the monitor, you can see already that the graph has moved over by several nanometers. And I'm going to continue to cool this, and I'll see as this proceeds. You won't notice much of a change in the, temp in the uh, visual appearance of the spot uh, until you get a change of maybe as much as 10 or 12 nanometers. It'll still look visibly red. You won't really be sure if it looks much different. And as a matter of fact, it really hasn't cooled all that much. But the power goes up pretty quickly. Something else uh, I've noticed with this, even when you do fill it with uh, liquid nitrogen fairly quickly, is that the heated surfaces of the metal components inside tend to cause the liquid nitrogen to boil and form a gaseous ins insulating layer. So uh, the cooling effect of the liquid nitrogen tends to be slower uh, when the differential temperature is actually larger. Uh, it's kind of counterintuitive, but eventually you get to the point where the liquid no longer is boiling off and there's a good thermal uh, contact, then the temperature tends to plummet pretty quickly. I'm going to add some more, and I'm probably even going to need to get some more. You can keep filming that. I'm just going to pop over here and pour up a little more with the measurement. There's a little bit more of the liquid nitrogen in here. And as you can see, the temperature is now 12.3 degrees centigrade, and our power output has already risen to 305 milliwatts. And I haven't done anything to the driving current. I can detect a very slight variation in the color. Uh, it's subtle, but it looks a little bit oranger to me. Uh, as you can see, uh, we're moving down to the uh, mid one, uh, three, 630 nanometer range. And you can also see that the peak looks a little bit more powerful too. Eventually, the peak will seem to decrease in power. And part of what causes that is simply the uh, diodes as the uh, wavelength changes the lenses in the apparatus up here are no longer um, appropriate in terms of their focal lengths, and you actually have to re -shi you have to shift some of the um, optics that send the beam over to the spectrograph. Part of the reason for using this very flexible hose is because if you do spill, it's kind of nice not to spill it all over these optics. I'm not so sure they would like uh, being splashed with liquid nitrogen. Uh, 
Uh, if you are going to be using something like this as a projector, a uh, source for a projector or a Lumia, uh, one of the things that I would advise is once you put the cover on this, that you isolate the fill tube through the top of the, of the cover, maybe with an insulating uh, foam sheath around the, the tubing. Uh, but I think you don't need to necessarily make it such a protuberant uh, type of fill device, just simply something that'll protect the surfaces as you're dumping in a lot of liquid nitrogen during its use. And we're going to go colder. You can see already that the temperature meter is showing that we're below zero. And something else I'll show you too is that the temperature of the uh, window is dropped a little bit. It's a little above room temperature. And I think I may have to increase the current a little bit just so we don't get some frost and get a change in the uh, output. Now you can see also, as it's gotten colder, you can see how much the power has gone up. We're now at 355 milliwatts. Again, no change in the current at about 14 below zero. It is noticeably brighter to me. It's also oranger. Um, it's right now running just a little bit uh, red of 630 nanometers and we're going to lower the temperature even further. Minus 20 degrees and we're at 365 degree, uh, milliwatts power continues to rise and the wavelength continues to shift blue. I'll go ahead and bump the mouse and so you can see we're probably down around 629 nanometers at minus 24. It's interesting how good an insulator uh, the doer is. If you're not running the laser, this doer will hold this liquid nitrogen in it for about two days. When you run the laser, as I've run it at um, prior to this test, at about 100 degrees uh, below, uh, it takes about an hour for the temperature of the diodes to bring the temperature of the inside of the doer up to room temperature with no cryogen at all, just from the thermal inertia of the components inside. I'm going to get a little more liquid nitrogen while you're filming that. One of the nice things about liquid nitrogen is it's cheap. Uh, the liquid nitrogen in the northeast here cost me less than two dollars a liter and I've used for this test so far about one liter. I'm going to dial up the temperature on the window heater a little bit because the window temperature has already dropped to 31 degrees from the liquid nitrogen vapors that are leaving the doer. And so I've brought this up to about 9 watts right now just to try to keep the temperature above ambient. As you can see here, we are at minus 50 degrees centigrade and we're at almost 400 milliwatts when we started at about 245 and that's just from the thermal efficiency effect. If you take a look at the monitor, you'll also see that in addition to the peak having shifted, it's also dropped in, in its height, which doesn't make a lot of sense because of the fact that we're producing more power. But it's probably due to the shifting of the uh, position of the sine filter, or the cosine filter. So I'll just adjust that to bring the laser beam back up. And this has nothing again to do with the output, it just means I'm lining up the spectrograph with the laser a little better, like it used to be. Temperature is now minus 60 degrees centigrade, 
and we're at about 400 milliwatts. We'll go down a little lower. Minus 67 degrees, and we're at uh, 403 milliwatts. And it's visually much oranger to me than it used to be. We're at about 622 nanometers, so we're just around the color of a Heaney laser. Colder yet. Now, one of the things that's interesting about these um, cooling experiments is that, uh, practically speaking, uh, this laser, because of its proximity to the red, uh, it's very difficult to imagine how I'm going to actually be able to use this laser in a typical projector because only SEMROC manufactures filters that have a uh, sharp enough cutoff and a high enough transmission and reflection that would allow me to use the typical dichroic or typical um, interference filter for combining colored laser beams where I could use a 638 nanometer laser and overlap it to a orange laser and so as a result I think what I may do with this laser rather than what my original intention was which was to fiber feed this into a, an RGB projector to turn it into an ROGB projector and that is I think it's going to be one of the colors in a um, a Lumia or a, uh, a non-scan type of laser projector. So, uh, also, it just give a variety of different types of projections or images that we can do and take advantage of the fact that this laser uh, truly produces orange, not a man manufactured orange, by combining red and green and would produce a relatively unusual color in a Lumia. A little more cold. And as you can see, we're having some trouble with the window keeping up with the temperature of the vapor. But uh, if I back off a little bit in the rate that I'm flowing in more liquid, it shouldn't get too cold. As you can see, the temperature now has hit um, almost minus 100 degrees centigrade. And the power is now up to 419 milliwatts. The wavelength, I would read it right now, is probably around 618 nanometers and is becoming almost a little uncomfortably bright on the screen and definitely more orange. So we're going to go a little colder. No colder yet. We're at minus 112 degrees and power output about 424 milliwatts. And I'm keeping up with my window, so hopefully we won't get much frost on that. And the beam is getting uh, pretty orange. Keep going down. Temperature now is 121 below zero, and we're probably at about 615 
nanometers and the power is up to 423 milliwatts. I don't know if it's visible on the camera, but it's orange. Uh, it's no longer a red beam. Add some more coal. The intensity of the beam is getting a little bit high, and so I'm just going to dial down the uh, shirt out of the way. Dial down the uh, spectrograph so it's not getting too exposed, keeps it within the range. We're at minus 135 degrees. getting some strange effects in here. I don't really know how to describe what's happening, but some of the gas from the boiling liquid uh, seems to be kind of working its way around some of the loose fitting some of the gaps in the structure. And uh, sometimes you get some pretty uh, interesting beam effects. temperature even a little further. We're at minus 160. The temperature of the window heater has gone way down. So what I did was I went around to the back and adjusted the flex mod to an increased uh, voltage to drive the lasers because the uh, original uh, settings on the mean well were six volts, which gave me two and a, uh, essentially four and a half volts of driving voltage for these two diodes in series. That's only two and a quarter volts of driving voltage before the flex mod would uh, essentially blank out. So I brought it all the way up to seven and a half volts uh, to supply the flex mod, giving me a three volt per diode head uh, to drive the diodes, and now they seem to be working just fine. Uh, I've reached the point that I think there's enough liquid nitrogen in there uh, that it seems to be maintaining this temperature of 191 uh, below zero. And I could probably knock it down a couple more degrees, but I don't see the point. It's not gonna change things substantially. Uh, the wavelength has shifted visibly to the orange. It doesn't look like a sodium vapor lamp, but it is no longer, no, by no means is this red anymore. This is clearly an orange light. The wavelength is actually measured at 608 nanometers. Uh, the power output has um, increased by about 80% from baseline at 191 below zero. And despite the fact that uh, the Internal optics, the Optima uh, four millimeter lens inside is actually running at 190 below zero. The focal shift is fairly minimal. And so therefore, what I'm going to do now is I'm gonna go ahead and break from the video and I'm gonna put in the two missing optical components that are gonna be used to combine the beam. And then I'm gonna demonstrate something that I don't think you will probably see anywhere else in the world. And I think that'll be kind of neat. Okay, so I spent about 10 minutes putting the optics back on the laser so that it operates as a full dual output module. Uh, put the folding mirror, the polarizing beam splitter cube back in, and now the beam is folded 
and sent through a spatial filter. I always use these now. And then recollimated here in about a five by five millimeter beam. The beam that, that comes out, I'm going to send through a diffraction grating. And the reason I said that you won't see this anywhere else is because to try to produce an orange diffraction grating or deform, orange diffraction image, you cannot do that with a composite beam of red and green. You can only do that if the beam is inherently orange. So what I've done is I've set this up with the two lasers and I'll turn the power back on to where it was before. And then what I'll do is I'll turn off the lights in the room and you can take a look on the other side of the room at what it does. So this is 608 nanometers wavelength. It's right now about uh, two watts of power. And uh, I've got the thing dialed up so that uh, with the laser full, uh, the alarm will go off on the thermometer if ever the temperature goes above 180 degrees uh, below zero. And at that warm temperature, I know the liquid nitrogen has run out. And eventually, uh, the wavelength will shift back to uh, 638 at room temperature. The safe thing about this situation is that if you're not trying to overdrive the diodes, then all you will lose if you lose your cryogen because you're sloppy and you don't refill the container is you'll lose your wavelength shift. You won't blow out your diodes. They'll just get red and less efficient. So that's pretty much it for this video. I'm happy with this module and the next time I show this will probably be in some sort of a beam table or a Lumia projector. And so I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.